Welcome, everybody. My name is Jelani, for those of you who don't know. Um, and this is the 42nd episode of the B-Side Rising series put on by B-Side World, where our goal here is always to provide an opportunity for many of the wonderful projects on our growing B-Side World dashboard to just kind of formally introduce themselves, update their progress, highlight their achievements, and just generally engage with both the B-Side World and the wider B-Side World. Now, that's the normal framework of how we do B-Side Rising. But I think in this episode, this is going to be a very special one. And it really kind of sent home the idea that our overarching goal here is to address the people, provide individuals an opportunity to leverage awesome tooling, awesome platforms, awesome communities to kind of help push B side to change or bring, you know, various changes to the uh, legacy stand industry. Right? And so essentially in the, today's episode, we're really going to be focused on that community collective engagement. So we have Myself from DSI World, Joshua here, who's the founder of DSI World. We have Carlos, who is the founder of, or a part of the Nerd University, and I guess probably one of its major leaders. And Carlos was actually the one to reach out to, and Carlos is ATOX.eSI. Um, Carlos reached out to us to kind of create this framework to allow for the superconductor research to happen in a coordinated fashion. So huge shout out to Carlos, and he's been, you know, indispensable in kind of putting this together and really has a lot of passion in pushing forward. Um, through conversations with that, we reached out to Lateral, the coordination network, and that's Felix here. And we also talked to other players in the space, like Oksana at Gosh, who Gosh plays an incredible role as an open source GitHub um, platform to allow for more decentralized access to repositories. Um, and then we have a bunch of other friends in the space that are interested in coming along. We even invited Research Hub because that's a publishing opportunity. Maybe at the end of that pipeline, of discovery pipeline of the discovery pipeline, they sit as you know, the kings in the space currently. So would love to integrate with them and are currently working on the back end, on the back end to do so. So that's our little opening spiel. I'm gonna kind of kick it off um, to allow the individual participants to introduce themselves. So Josh, if you wanna kick it off, short intro of yourself, and then you can pass the buck on to another participant. Yeah, wonderful. Thanks, Jelani. Um, pleasure to be here as a guest on DSI Rising. It's my first time. Uh, so thank you, Jelani. And yeah, I'm founder of DSI World. Glad everybody's here on, on the Twitter. Um, the episode is number 42, which if you're a reader of uh, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, you'll know 42 is the answer, answer to life. So that's interesting. Hopefully we can find out the answer today. That's actually very interesting. <laughs> um, I'll, just, I'll just continue, I guess. Um, I'm Atox Carlos, however you may want to call me. Uh, but I'm at heart a researcher. Like when I was little, I wanted to be a scientist. And I was sort of like disillusioned by how traditional science is set up. And I sort out, like set out to fix that in a way. And I think that what we're pushing right now is a framework where science can be more accessible to more people and have more roles available and actually make peer review, you know, peer review rather than some whatever it is right now. Great, Carlos. Glad to have you. Absolutely agree. Um, I don't know, Carlos, if this is your first foray into the DSI space or to the DSI ecosystem, but I think this is a perfect proof of principle or proof of concept if we can get this off the ground or as we get this off the ground to kind of showcase what we can do. Uh, Felix, go ahead, please. Yeah, thanks so much. Uh, really happy to be here as a guest as well. Uh, thanks, Jelani, um, for the invite. Um, so, yeah, I'm Felix, one of the co-founders of Lateral. And Lateral is a tool for researchers to uh, do lit reviews faster, uh, to basically go through documents much faster and do their research faster, supported by machine learning. Um, and we've launched an initiative called the Coordination Network, as we've been very involved in DSI over the last year, um, because now that everyone is basically able to work much faster, supported by different AI tools, uh, we saw a, a kind of twofold uh, 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 approach that we felt was really important uh, through having worked with a lot of researchers. We saw how, how difficult and broken the kind of system is also for um, funding to researchers and the whole pro, uh, publishing into journals. And on the other hand, now that everyone was working much faster, we see a huge uh, opportunity to coordinate uh, research as we're discussing here together in a much more effective uh, decentralized uh, uh, fashion. And so the coordination network basically is 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 a a network um, where we've been working together with uh, you know Foresight Institute and, and Molecule and DSI DAOs uh, who have been testing the private alpha of our of our tool now to roadmap uh, solutions to complex problems 
Um, and this is an open source initiative um, with kind of seamless participation where also researchers and, and anyone can participate and contribute uh, to these roadmaps. And, and then are basically the idea is that they will then be rewarded and attributed uh, for that. Um, it's at the moment hosted on ceramic and decentralized. So we see a lot of amazing opportunities there for creating new reputation systems and new ways to incentivize researchers and, and anyone participating and building on each other and um, yeah, creating a much faster way to solve uh, complex problems that are out there. And so that's why we're so, so excited about DSI and being here today. That's fantastic. We definitely are going to need to get you guys up for your own dedicated DSI Rising episode because I think this is a very usable tool for not just DSI, DSI scientists, but just scientists in general. So we definitely need to showcase that. Um, Oksana, please, if you want to introduce Vash and yourself, I'd love to go to learn more. Hi, everyone. I'm Oksana. Uh, I'm uh, direct, director of science development at GOSH. Uh, it's a company that created um, open source decentralized GitHub uh, for decentralized management of uh, repositories and any repository that you uh, uploaded or created on GOSH is a DAO by itself. So you can invite anybody inside and manage it together. And also um, based on the GOSH, we created uh, Jocelyn Dao. Jocelyn Dao is a DAO for scientists at risk who are struggling to start or continue their research work. And we are trying to help them with the review process and um, collaborative work on the research project. And of course, uh, because of we are uh, in early beginning, I mean, in terms of DAO, we are not so maybe um, recognizable as a DAO, but as, as a decentralized GitHub, we can put, uh, I think, significant value in this project. Thank you. Awesome. And Rod, last but not least, uh, Rod, Rod, last but not least, please uh, give us a short intro of yourself, Lunko, and then Josh, I'm going to kick it to you to kind of put it all together into a frame of what we're actually seeking to do here. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you for the invitation. I really like uh, the initiative. Uh, my name is Rod. I'm a space professional, actually. I'm a professional space uh, systems engineer. Uh, I've been in crypto since 2016, and I'm a huge fan of uh, the uh, new decentralized approach uh, to public goods, to open source, to uh, DSI and uh, DSpace funding. I'm founder of a project called Lunko. Lunko is a tool for engineers to exchange uh, designs in a decentralized way, um, mostly focused on uh, building, sorry, on designing a colony on the moon. Uh, I'm also a core member of uh, Mundao, and I'm really a huge fan of uh, Gitcoin and uh, uh, quadratic funding for basically funding public goods. And I'm a huge fan fan of a new decentralized frameworks to build tools basically uh, i'm still amazed by the last uh, this around how it was run i think it's an amazing source of uh, inspiration for achieving a complicated goal and here i'm happy to support the initiative uh, with uh, my knowledge and uh, yeah happy to learn how it could be done how um uh, um, superconductor research could be done in a decentralized manner from my side. I have some experience uh, manufacturing robotics uh, on a global scale in Europe and uh, the US. Maybe it could help uh, with the process. Thank you so much. Cool. Thanks, everybody, and welcome. Um, so, Jelani, I'm just uh, just to clarify, you want me to sort of go over the general idea of this framework and what we hope to achieve with it, yeah? Correct. And then, Carlos, maybe you can chime in, or either before or afterwards, just to kind of give an idea of what actually a superconductor is, why is this is, why is everybody kind of hyped up over what's being discovered, and then maybe then, Josh, can put it, go into the framework. Sure. Can we hand over to you, Carlos? Yeah, Carlos. yeah of course. So, um... So first, I, I have to uh, preface this with the fact that I am not an expert in material science. Um, I come at this problem more from a, a general science perspective and how research is done overall, right? And the cool thing about science is that the scientific method is so like broadly applicable, right? Now, the idea with superconductors in general is that it's uh, that 
superconductors have been in, have been around for a long, long time, but there are very super hard things to uh, make happen in production and take a lot of energy because you have to cool them so much, right? And for example, you can actually see superconductors working on MRI machines all the time, um, and they use them to be able to to take those images, but they are super expensive machines. Now, what just happened with this research is that uh, these scientists in South Korea have uh, found that they can make this alloy between simple uh, common uh, metals that when basically cooked together, create a, a, a lattice structure or a, like a meta structure that allows for electrons to basically go through the entire metal without losing any resistance to heat or anything like that. So I just went into like more technical terms, but the main thing is that um, this allows for much simpler superconductors. Um, and this could allow for things like, for example, handheld MRI machines or like even hoverboards, which ha have everyone excited, which is not too far fetched, right? Because these things have some special properties that allow them to basically levitate. So those are the most interesting, like exciting aspects of the technology. But there's so much we don't know with this. And this basically unlocks a whole new layer of basic science that could affect many industries like I come from healthcare, uh, but it could also affect the space industry and basically the computer industry, the crypto industry. Like it's a long, long conversation. And just because it's such a long conversation and such a big, broad topic, what I set out to do is try and find a mechanism to map that knowledge and sort of have a common ground where we can have that discussion productively uh, and, and sort of like find leads and, and do this research process without having to to uh, rely on institutions to enable that. Uh, because like, if you see now, like everyone who's working on this is basically a scientist attached to some institution who has some sort of government like funding or, or, or something like that or private equity. And we are the ones who have to find a way to do the same thing without those systems. So I bring it over to Joshua because I think I've spoken a lot. Not at all. Thank you, mate. Yeah. So, look, I think I think the important thing to understand here, okay, you could, if you're more interested in the uh, the actual specifics of what a superconductor is, how it's created, and what it's used for, maybe this is sort of not necessarily the conversation for you. This is more of an overview about what what is being done right now in this distributed uh, research community regarding this superconductor research, regarding the LK99 paper what it means for science right and and what it means for the larger situation of society okay and so start off uh with the last one right which is what it means for the larger situation for society because if you can imagine that we have here uh an instrument the superconductor which is typically very difficult to produce or you know, very costly at least to produce and therefore the means for production are always concentrated in a very small uh, area and the supply chain therefore is very con uh, concentrated as well so what you have is uh concentration of supply chain concentration of wealth concentration of the power of distribution of this essential ingredient for research now if you can imagine that this becomes much easier much cheaper uh much more accessible right then the secondary and tertiary effects of that is is quite massive. And the superconductor, this is one piece of research which which is being you know, potentially discovered right now. Who knows what the outcome will be, right? But the ability for this to potentially reinvigorate society, uh, reinvigorate a sort of almost a, a secondary industrial revolution, is some things that people have been saying. Yes, it might be overblown because who knows if this is even replicable. Um, but the concept is there of a fundamental. Piece of re a piece of research that changes our fundamental understanding of of material science and then what that can then mean for manufacturing and then from manufacturing down down through to just people in society in general so that's kind of the scope of what could be done you know, of what kind of impact this research can can make on society right now so we can talk about that if anyone wants to talk about the societal impact that's always a good topic for conversation but we'll hone in a little bit more now on the, the impact on science or the, the demonstration of this and what uh, in, in science right now and what impact it's having. So you might have seen this, uh, the information about this be released last week as the, the Korean uh, scientists uh, released their paper. Now, since then, 
you've seen private equity firms, uh, you've seen universities, you've seen private research labs, public institutions, uh, all of these sort of members of the kind of like academic elite are trying to replicate this because again, for these reasons, it's potentially revolutionary reasons. But what you've also seen crop up is a number of sort of individuals or distributed participants, people who are, you know, for example, Carlos, right? Carlos is looking to replicate this, potentially try and replicate this research in his local lab with the local university. And so Carlos is an individual, right? And you're seeing a lot of individuals pop up who, because this piece of research is, uh, made from relatively cheap ingredients with a relatively simple manufacturing process, you're seeing this distributed science taking place in real time. And I would personally say uh, it's probably the first example of DSI being done in the wild um, because yes, open science is done, but DSI, in my opinion, specifically uh, factors in the blockchain, factors in the decentralized part of the decentralized technologies. And weirdly enough, the superconductor research has popped up all over my timelines of all the social medias that I follow large amounts of crypto people. So it seems to be something that's crossing over very rapidly with the decentralized community in particular. Um, and this presents to us at DSI World a wonderful opportunity to bring in the DSI tooling that's being built by everybody in this call right now to some some things, for example, lateral, you know, you've got a, a, a Web3 wallet login for as a standard for most of the interactions. Now, a lot of scientists might not be so comfortable to do this as a standard. If you go to uh, a scientific community who are trying to solve an issue and you say, let's use lateral and they say, oh, what about this Web3 stuff? I'm not sure into that. Well, this is an interesting in intersection between a decentralized community, uh, sorry, a distributed community of peoples and those who are capable or interested in using Web3. So for us at DSI World, this presents a wonderful opportunity for us to uh, create a framework to showcase uh, the power of DSI and then use this framework to further the best, the best research possible on superconductors to incentivize individuals through potential incentive mechanisms uh, to contribute to this collective, to collect all of the data, all of the resources, to share resources. Um, and essentially what we're doing is we're creating the decentralized hive mind, right? Which the tools that are being built right now are there for. So Oksana uh, from Gosh, you know, this decentralized GitHub, this is the perfect use case for things like this. So the context of what we're doing here at DSI World with the, the Superconductor Collective, what we're doing in conjunction with the Nerd University, um, the context is we're building a framework that can be applied to the Superconductor research, but then can eventually be packaged and applied to any research task, any large research task in particular. So if there's ever a research task that there's individuals around the world who can do this without the help of institutions because the costs of production are relatively minimal or it's mostly theoretical in principle, um, or even if it is something that requires a large institutional size funding, maybe there's crowdsourcing available. Th this framework that we're hoping to build here, we, we're hoping we can scale it, package it, and then it can be used to sort of become a, one of the foundations of DSI. And I think that you know, something I always say when I when I talk about DSI, when I'm talking at conferences and things, is I, I think that DSI is the most powerful use case for blockchain technology. And I think that if we can actually have a powerful use case for DSI, which is this, right? And if we can show that DSI actually empowers this use case rather than holds it back or adds layers of unnecessary complexity, then it's very it's it's almost like the gate of the floodgates, right? Of which scientists can now utilize this tech and they're happy to utilize it. And then, you know, even if your side point if you're not into DSI, but you're a crypto person, if you see this potential for the floodgates of institutional funding and interest, then you'll back it also because it's good for the general Web3 ecosystem. So, I mean, if anyone, by the way, if anyone wants to question or talk about any of these topics, please just put your hand up and we can we can bring you up. But yeah, so that's- I just, wanna, I just wanna chime in uh, for one thing because you're framing it as, I mean, and, and it's awesome the way you're framing it as democratizing science and finding new ways to do it and i want to expand on that and 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 invite people who are listening to think about science as everything like any question that you possibly have could be answered using the scientific method and the term that i've has been like sort of like running through my head is this proof of thought idea if we can create a knowledge graph and map what we know what's there and what we don't know we can then ask others to help and then also use a blockchain to prove to others that we are the ones who participate in that knowledge making. And that's where this sort of like 
gets bootstrapped into something entirely else where everyone can now be a scientist because there's many layers of knowledge creation. I, yeah, so that's, I think that's a great point. Uh, I don't want this to stay too philosophical and theoretical. I'd like to kind of dig down into what this actual framework looks like. We've touched you know, a little bit on gosh, on lateral, but how does this actually come together? Um, but before that, Rod, please feel free to, to, to unmute yourself and go ahead. Yeah, I just, uh, as I've said, I'm a huge fan of uh, quadratic finding. For me personally, it changed my life. And uh, I'm not joking. I do not want to go into details right now. But um, the way how quadratic finding works on a social level is that you have to engage with the, your community to raise donations. And when the, that uh, it, it just forces you to engage with that community. And uh, I think a lot of uh, inspirations could be, like it could be used as a source of uh, inspiration to fund uh, activities like, for example, even right now as a, a collective, we can quite easily raise some money to um, uh, support the, the uh, superconductor research and we can find several collectives who, who could... Uh, propose different options uh, in terms of research and we can uh, fund them. From that perspective, uh, it's a nice source of funding uh, uh, for, for a project. Ju just it allows them to focus on uh, building. Um, so somehow, I believe somehow things that happened in the DSI uh, get quite better around how actually I subbed out to, to achieve one goal. Um, could be formed. So uh, I think a lot of inspiration could be taken from there as well as um, there is a nice tool called uh, Coordinate. The whole goal of this tool is the retroactive funding. When you have a small collective of uh, people uh, at the end of the project, uh, everyone assesses uh, everyone. Basically, everyone gets 100 points and must distribute those 100 points among uh, other people except uh, themselves and uh, with all of uh, those tools uh, including of course all the tools that allow to uh, track uh, contribution of uh, single person like for example hyper uh, for certain actions and uh, gosh for example for tracking the exact contribution into for example scientific paper I think uh, all in all it could form a really amazing tool when um, it'll be really easy for people to start uh, engage with the community and uh, find uh, that activity in a decentralized manner when uh, no single entity uh, would be needed to, to hold the activity. A small sub -DAOs could be formed to achieve one specific goal. According to, to, um, to procedures that happened during uh, this round, Sorry, I'm really inspired by, by that. And I think that we should uh, make an article about uh, the history because uh, it, 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 it was cool from my perspective. Absolutely. So, you know, again, to, to kind of dig down into the nitty gritty and for those of you who are coming in a little bit after we started, this is an open discussion. Um, if you'd like to come in and talk, like to come in and add your two cents, you know, talk about another platform like R Rod just did about coordinate suggest ways to make it interoperable. This whole framework, the goal of this framework is its interoperability, right? Being able to plug and play with different toolings to help push forward the scientific endeavor. In this case, superconductors, but that may be different for something like a drug discovery or some astrophysics or for a social science uh, based project. So we really wanna help flush out what is the best base layer and then allow individuals to extrapolate off of this and build their own individual or you know, research specific collective. Um, so again, please feel free to come up on stage. Um, you're more than welcome to. So with that all being said, let's talk about the nitty gritty. What does this essential research pipeline that we're putting together actually look like in its current iteration? And then how can we extrapolate off that for other endeavors? So Joshua or Carlos, Carlos, maybe you, depending on how you wanna do this. Um, let's talk about the different points in this pipeline that we, or the different tool sets in this pipeline that we're using right now to kind of consolidate all this information and create this coordination graph. Yeah. Okay, cool. So Carlos, I'll pass over to you for the nerd brain, as we called it, um, for Obsidian and the plugins, if that's all right, but I'll sort of give a, sure. an overview of, of it as it, as it lies. So we have really, um, 
sort of three main components of this, right? So we have the 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 repo, which is the GitHub or the you know Gosh or whichever whichever repo that we're using. We have the repo, and we have the sort of um, the processing layer, which is something that processes all of the information that's held in the repo. And then you have the sort of communications channels. Now, so the communications channels is how do we all discuss and how do we collaborate? The processing layer is what do we do with this data that's held in the GitHub? And the GitHub is where all of this growing corpus of knowledge uh, lives. So the flow would look roughly like this. We'd have the superconductor master repo, and then people would fork this. Anyone that comes into the community would fork this. And in that master repo, it contains all of the data that's happened, that's been researched so far within the superconductor collective. That's forked, and then it is processed using your favorite markdown editor. We are recommending Obsidian, and Carlos will explain why soon. Um, and all of this information is sort of within the GitHub. You process it, and you use it to inform your research. When you found something worth reporting, you commit it back to the master GitHub repo, and it's committed, and then that's the, the library that keeps growing. The communication channels are separate from this, but we're looking at tooling that allows the communications that go on, just the discussions that we have, for example, on a Telegram channel, um, the way these discussions are to add that also into the growing corpus of knowledge so that these uh, the, the processing channels that we have, for example, Obsidian, can actually process the, the discussions that have happened in the communications channels. So these are the three core components. Um, we, you know, we, we've looked at some different resources, different ability, uh, different sort of um, ways to do this. It's still early stage, so our communications channel in particular needs a lot of work because how to how to handle such a large amount of information, right? It's such a difficult process. So we're looking at ways to refine this and make it easier. Um, but this master repo is for the superconductor collective. This master repo uh, contains all of the growing corpus of knowledge of what we're building for the uh, what we're researching for the superconductors. But the idea that we're having here that Carlos is really passionate about and he's going to tell you more about is a layer above this superconductor repo is kind of the, the hive mind brain, right? Which actually is, uh, which actually pulls in data from all of the master repos for the different research goals. So if we have the superconductor research goal, that master repo feeds into the hive mind brain. If we have something about AI, for example, if we have an AI collective, that also feeds into the hive mind brain. And the idea is that when you're processing this information on the individual project on the superconductor collective you're also drawing from the corpus of knowledge from all of these other collectives so you're creating a central hive mind from which this specific research task pulls a lot of its data sets and then that specific research task collects its own relevant data sets and that is processed in this in this collective that we're doing right now so carlos do you want to talk a little bit more about what you've been looking at building on obsidian and how that can also scale to other markdown editors potentially or other potential tools and just your general overview of the of the the nerd brain or the hive mind yeah 100 percent. and uh, that was an excellent overview of how it works and i think about that everyone by the end got a little bit scared about like the scale of of what we're doing like hive mind and superconductors super DAOs. but the point is that my whole journey has been trying to figure out how to process data at a scale, at the speed of which is being created in our modern time. So the whole premise is, first, uh, Obsidian is trying to be as open as possible, so we have as many data points as we can. And, and to what Joshua said, the idea of having a multidisciplinary uh, repository allows you to sort of apply parts of its knowledge to other parts of, of what's being created and, and have this process of discovery of knowledge. And this is all enabled because of um, AI. And and here's the thing, like my main focus all always has been AI since like med school and stuff. I've, I've done a lot of work on it. And with when ChatGPT came out, like everyone was started to work previously on having your brain, having your brain, your brain. And I, I tried too, but I found all of the things I tried were too cumbersome uh, until I found knowledge graphs and specifically how Obsidian handles it, which if you ever used Wikipedia, it's exactly like Wikipedia. Uh, you create a link and that link goes to another file. But the point is that on the background, Obsi uh, the, chat, the Obsidian plugin that we're using is creating embeddings for each file that you're creating. So you can then uh, 
do two things. One is have relational searches where every time that you create something, the AI is now aware of it. And if you just browse to the relevant topic, you're going to find the latest uh, information available to you inside of the graph uh, to relevant to that topic. And on the other hand, you can talk to the AI as if it was like a project manager who is aware of everything that's going on. And, and the Obsidian Markdown style allows you to uh, tell the AI what, where to look, which is the most difficult part for me so far, uh, allowing, for example, uh, do the query like, hey, uh, nerd brain, can you summarize all of the research topics in superconductors? And it's going to give you a briefing that you can read and then figure out where you want to spend your time. And uh, it can even give you, like, here's the other thing about data processing. Um, most people are trying to use AI to create knowledge. But uh, what we're trying to do here is use the AI to frame questions, to help organize knowledge, and help uh, relate your information to others. So uh, with that, and and with this collective effort, then it makes sense to sort of put your knowledge into the graph because you want to be exposed to everything else because that's how knowledge is made, right? And and the whole setup with traditional institutions does not allow for that. So essentially we can kind of think of this in as much as it is a consolidation of information, so generating a mass corpus, it also facilitates through different forms of embedding a distillation process. So it helps exponentially increase the speed at which you can do research because you can assimilate all that research within your own sub corpus with so that forking of the master repo and your own internal obsidian um, and kind of draw that down a lot faster, right? Is that a good way to kind of frame? Yes, that? exactly. Well, what I'm doing is, for example, as papers come out, I just put the papers in a new note and then ask the AI to give me like a like the, the highlights of it. Absolutely. Rob, go ahead, please. Um, maybe I've uh, missed it, but uh, um, do you have any specific uh, AI, uh, I assume a uh, large language model in um, head? Yeah, we're using uh, the normal chat GPT API, but the key is that we are creating embeddings for the data that it's using as context. So you could imagine it as a pair of glasses that have been trained on the whole vector space of the knowledge. Like you turn the whole vault into a vector space and then use that as a filter for the LLM. And you can, the cool thing about this is that the embeddings that we create are super portable. Uh, so you can use the embeddings with any AI like Back, like alpaca or any anything that you want to use, and it will create the same effect. Um, I am a huge fan of uh, open source. Um, so, is there any chance to uh, make the system um, to be able to use uh, different AIs, ideally to switch them on the fly, and uh, ideally to to be able just you know to choose what to use. Yeah, a hundred percent. I have the repository for the plugin, and one of the things that I wanted to do is like expand on the work that's been done there, because there's a lot of uh, engineering that you can do on the prompt level to have stuff like, for example, you can have. Uh, uh, an agent that's running uh, every so often and he's like a librarian who is just like making sure like uh, uh, stuff is enforced, making sure reference are valid or, or things like, like that. And there's a lot of work that could be done on top of something like this. Um, and, and yeah, I mean, we could start talking on that. I would love to and, and, and sort of like start, start those threats on the brain too. See, this is exactly, this is exactly what we're looking to have here, right? have this, create this human machine interface that is composable open source because we're decentralized science maxi, you know, can incorporate as many of the different toolings that exist out there or that is going to exist out there. And I think this provides that, that base framework that, you know, honestly, I think the, the entire DSI space has kind of been uh, missing. There's not a lot of interoperability happening across the different platforms. I mean, part of that is because we're so early and a lot of it is being built. A lot of it is in alpha, beta, um, 
But I think this prevents, presents us with an opportunity to actually put our money where our mouth is, or at least put our efforts where our mouth is, um, and start to leverage this tech openly, accessibly to a lot of people. Um, and to kind of put that point, you know, we're, we're leveraging Obsidian, which is not inherently a decentralized platform. Um, but I think there's layers that we can build on top of it, as Carlos has mentioned, as Rod has alluded to, and as Joshua has talked about. Um, and I think one of those is, is lateral coordination, it's particularly when, when we went to them, was an idea of lateral kind of sits on top of a really good on-chain proof of provenance commitment layer. And so Felix, I know, you know we had this conversation with Martin, and I'm sure he might have kept you apprised on what exactly we're looking to do here, but I'd love to kind of hear how you think the coordination network which fit into what we presented so far and how can it can help uh, you know, further enhance the goals here? Yeah, thanks so much. Yeah, for sure. Um, yeah, exactly. So I think uh, a lot of what has been said so, so far aligns very strongly with what we're um, doing at the coordination network, um, especially because you know, our background with having built lateral, um, which also focuses on um, not generative AI, but, you know, machine learning to match content. Um, so one of the key things that we've seen there is that, you know, that helps you work much faster as an individual, um, but also with a view to the whole open source and all the tools that are out there now these days um, and all the LLMs and things like that, we thought, okay, this, this has to, you know, work much in a much bigger way to actually coordinate people around, you know, uh, around different topics. And so I think what's what's really interesting is that yeah so what we built what we've built on on the coordination network side of things is kind of twofold is using generative AI to kind of help you roadmap what you're trying to solve so that's why we've also been working with a lot of the DAOs to kind of help them you know we're trying to solve this problem so you're mapping out what what we know um, as Carlos also said you know what we know and you know what steps can we take to achieve our goals and then basically have experts or anyone participating validate that. And I think what you mentioned as well, um, because what we built is on hosted on Ceramic, I think what, what we can offer is the fact that, you know, you sign in with your wallet and every contribution you make is attributed to you. And so the way this also works with the DAOs is that you can then, and this is the next step, but um, actually put funding to the different parts of the roadmap and the different things they're trying to solve and then hand out rewards or like drip to the different people participating. And the thing that we always found super frustrating, um, you know, also having worked with a lot of researchers, academics in the traditional system is that, you know, it's all about publishing to journals and getting cited and that whole reputation system is just, you know, not, we feel not very compatible with, you know, how quickly information is coming about, how, how many people are motivated to participate. And so actually what we want to enable is a system where you're incentivizing everyone to make small contributions. They're being attributed for that. And, you know, other people with upvoting and things like that, like that can validate the contributions. People can get rewards and over time build, it builds a new reputation system. Um, you know, because you can say I made all these contributions and um, yeah, it, it also what Rod was saying um, uh, about kind of, you know, um, making sure that it's clear who, who made what particip uh, participate in what way. I think that's that's really really important. Um, and so yeah, so we've that's kind of what we've been focusing on. Um, so I think it, it really strongly aligns because it kind of also to the different things that are have been discussed, kind of uh, is is a tool focused on this process. If that makes sense. No, it's it's perfect. It's absolutely perfect, and it kind of it also extends beyond just the idea of people who are DeFi conscious and being able to if not retroactively, but directly attribute either reputation points or remuneration or incentivization to the participants. I think as a whole, science, biggest, one of the biggest fears in science, and for all scientists here, I'm sure you can attest to it, is the fear of being scooped. The fear of your work, all the efforts that you put into your research is being put out there and then being taken by somebody else. Um, and I think the importance of layering in the distributed ledger technology, whether it be blockchain or some other framework, is to be able to hard code stamp when contributions go. So when you fork the repo, you bring it, you add your corpus of information, and then you send it back to the master repo. When we incorporate all of this into lateral or into the coordination network, and I believe with the coordination network, you can actually do it directly on the coordination network too. So yeah. there's some, you can take a variety of steps depending on how comfortable you are with different aspects of 
this framework. There are various entry points that you can contribute to, which is amazing in and of itself, right? There's a value in and of itself, but you can, can secure the fact that you are this contributor, not just for yourself, but for your career, for your contribution to the record of knowledge. I think that's a very important point. And sometimes it's a little bit overlooked when we talk about all this cool DSI stuff, all this cool technology. At the end of the day, some of the base fears are intrinsic, instinctive base fears that just humans have. They don't want to be scooped off the, the effort that they're doing. And this is why I love lateral. This is why I love the coordination network. And I think it provides that opportunity. And that's why I'm very keen on having it integrate within this framework. And I think a lot of people will appreciate it. But Rob, please go ahead. Yeah, I'll try to be short. Um, just a few comments. First of all, um, guys, we are trying to solve uh, personal pain of uh, a lot of people uh, everywhere in a lot of DAOs. Um, I really I'm really interested in in your project. I just want to add that there is an interesting project that is called uh, Praise. Uh, basically, it's a way to to um, uh, praise praise contributors and maybe you you could take a look at it and uh, use some of its idea to improve the system because it sounds uh, really interesting and um, I'm really eager to discuss uh, how all the initiatives and how this framework could be used for retro uh, for, for for funding for retroactive funding because I think uh, uh, that part is really important for the whole uh, ecosystem and we really need the tools that allow people to jump in make a small contribution and uh, get rewarded from the community uh, almost instantly to to be able to continue contribution so um, yeah i think it's really important thanks yeah. so jo yeah okay josh I, I don't know if you're going to say the same thing as i am but there are there are so you know there are entities in the space that exist for that you can leverage Get coins to a certain extent, you can leverage give it to a certain extent, but they have their their pros and cons as do other kinds of things. These are all judges. You want to talk about the peer to peer marketplace? Yeah, no, I was going to say let's circle back to incentives and let Stanley say his piece first. As long as, yes. you know, Stanley, just Stanley, just know once you say your piece, we can come back to it, but we'll do incentives next. But I think because incentives is a long chat. So, Stanley, if you want to say what you've got to say first. Oh, thank you so much, and, and I will be brief. Um, I've been enjoying this conversation so much. Um, for, for other reasons, I'm a big fan of Obsidian as a tool for organizing knowledge, so I, I just can't wait to see what comes out of this um, conversation. And I, I missed the first part of the space, so forgive me if this comment is, is slightly, um, you know, retreading ground, but um, my, my original training was in quantum informatics. And so I did a lot of work with using large scale computer systems to um, study and verify uh, quantum effects in uh, materials, like particularly uh, spin lattices. And something, you know, pretty interesting happened with the verification of LK99 with in the past few days, the um, Lawrence Livermore National Laboratories, which have some of the very best quantum informatic um, uh, high performance compute clusters and experts. They, they verified um, not the specific effect, but that the kind of electron conduction bands lined up in a way that appeared to be very novel. And, and so we got some pretty strong, like in silico um, verification that something interesting was going on. It took just maybe 24 hours of computer time. And this to me is terrifying in, in a certain sense because of how close we got to not having any verification of this or, or any ability to utilize and develop this technology. Um, LK99 is so named because it was discovered in 1999 and left on a shelf for 20 years. And, and so I think it just, to me, more, more than anything I've really seen recently underlines, you know, the need of DSI so that we don't just have centralized decisions about, you know, what theories get cluster time. Um, and, and anyway, just there's a, a broader feeling of a near miss and a, a real chance for the space to kind of organize differently. So anyway, just to say, love this conversation. And thank you guys for having me up for a second. No, yeah, that, um, just to, just to chime back. Oh, sorry. Can I? No, 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 Carlos, go ahead, go ahead, please. Yeah, just to chime back on what you're saying in the in the space of uh, computer simulation and, and, and everything like this, the 
the way that we have structured the information, we can have an agent running simulations on stuff that people think of, like on a Telegram chat. So you just put a Telegram proposing an idea that gets fed into Obsidian. And by nighttime, you can have a, a system just check the best questions and run them on a, on a distributed computing that we pay through a DAO. So it gets, it gets pretty crazy. And it, it enables us as, as people, and the thing is knowledge is fractal, right? You, the edge of knowledge creation is fractal. And the only way to approach the, the, the steepness of the curve that we are at is through a, decent, a collaborative, decentralized, coordinated effort by like hundreds of thousands of people. And this is sort of like the only framework that I've found so far that would enable that, you know? Absolutely. I'll, uh, Felix, please. Yeah, no, I, yeah, this is, uh, super fascinating. And I just wanted to add to what, what you've all also said, because I think one of the, the super important things about DSI, and I think that's also what's been so exciting uh, for us uh, the last year uh, specifically, is just the, you know, at the moment, the researchers and in general, you know, doing research and being an academic, and like you're saying, the incentives are that you kind of hoard your knowledge. You're really worried that, you know, others are going to take it. You, you then try to publish that in, into a journal and the, the whole system of then being cited and things like that creates like a really, like it's, it's actually creating a really restrictive environment for, for science. And I think that this like the, the key to these small contributions is, is the fact that you really need a, a faster way to, to, to have people build on each other's work and each other's knowledge and a faster way to actually pay or reward people contributing um, because it, you know, you can't, it, how, how is it, how is it the case that, you know, nowadays, you know, people are publishing the journals, people are publishing in, in, in magazine and it's, it's costing the, the researchers so much money. It's actually making research, uh, you know, not very attractive in, in general as well. Don't make me start yeah, on exactly. that. Exactly. And so I think what we're so excited about these size and, you know, people making small, con you know, that, ha ha that is actually how, you know, you make quick progress. And, you know, the, there's so many mechanisms. I know so many fa people, uh, you know, working together now to work on the different parts, which is also so nice about these side, you know, it's every like this conversation, though, is everyone trying to work on small parts and, and form a whole together that creates progress. Um, and I think that's so exciting, you know, that also anyone can contribute, you know, anyone can contribute with expertise or with creating awareness or with funding um, and then be rewarded for that. And now with the whole LLMs, on the other hand, you know, um, there's such a, a need or important uh, point now where you need to find an effective way for for everyone to work faster together uh, curating what the llms are doing but also using that to make progress uh, much faster and i think that's that's what we're we're super excited uh, about um and yeah just uh, just wanted to say that um because you spoke no. so well about it no this is perfect and you know i i could be mistaken but i i know in the last year and a half like this has been around we haven't seen and again this is part of because the tooling is only now starting to come online but aside from a few examples of one or two projects working together we're not seeing that level of cohesion that level of interoperability that is actually providing the proof of concept of what DSI can do and i think this is one of the major first steps to do this this collective idea this collective integration um Joshua, I see your hand up. Maxwell, I noticed you came up as well. Did, did you want to say something? Um, or are you just here to kind of chime in when you can? No, um, like I am a scientist, a climate scientist, but I study engineering and all sorts of things because my father's an engineer. But um, like, uh, you're a very smart people. I'm, I'm just keen on um, listening to what you have. And then if I come up with any good ideas, maybe sharing them. Awesome. Wonderful. Cool. Feel free to jump in, Joshua, please. That's exactly what we, we want people to, to join in when they feel comfortable. Um, so, Rod, unless you have something else you want to say, you can jump in as well um, about the incentives. But I was going to touch on incentives that you just mentioned then. If you want to say anything else, so feel free to say it now. Uh, yeah, actually, I just wanted to uh, remind of um, this space quadratic funding. And uh, I really believe that we should... Uh, um, push forward the initiative and I think it could lay down another great uh, framework for uh, collaboration and it could be included into creation of 
I mean, such initiatives like with the superconductor, with the right, I believe, with the right uh, marketing support, and we as a group can provide such a support, could uh, raise a lot of uh, support from people all over the world. And um, yeah, so uh, my main point is that uh, let's try to to raise awareness about uh, the ecosystem together. And from that perspective, uh, definitely a huge shout out to you guys for all your initiatives. Uh, but uh, yeah, uh, I think we should uh, do, do it better. So it's not for you, it's more for the whole uh, community. You with your initiative, especially like with the, with the posters, uh, you're amazing. Sure. Thanks, Rod. So look, the yeah, quadratic funding is, is a wonderful tool, but it's just one tool. And so the issue with incentives is it requires money, right? And and where does that money come from? You know, you can give incentives uh, in some kind of token, some kind of native token. You can bid in your own token and give that as an incentive. But it's not an incentive unless you can cash it out somewhere. And if you want to cash out that token, it has to be in a liquidity pool, which is backed by, you know, quote unquote, real money. So Ethereum or USDC or whatever. So the, this is the issue, right? Is that when you have to provide incentives, you have to have some kind of capital. Now, if you're trying to advance a research, uh, which should hopefully help with the sort of democratization of access, I suppose, to some of these fundamental building blocks, um, what you're doing is you're essentially trying to build research, which is hard to monetize. Now, if you can't monetize your research, how do you then generate enough capital to distribute incentives? You know, charity or, or sort of public goods funding, it can only go so far, especially as you build a, an incredibly large network, such as what we're sort of amb the ambition is here. If we build this massive network um, of scientists, you know, how are they incentivized to contribute towards science? So this is kind of the issue that open science came across was um, if you were to be an open scientist, more often than not, you'd have to make massive lifestyle sacrifices in order to, to do science in an open source manner in this sort of decentralized distributed manner. Because likelihood is that you're not going to be able to patent it or if you if it's kind of against your ethos or the idea is that someone else will patent it first and they'll capitalize on it because um, because they have the capital to do so. So one of the things that's going to make this process of doing DSI through a framework such as this uh, incredibly challenging is that incentive layer, right? Because in order to create an incentive, if we have the superconductor collective raises money for this adventure, right? We raise $2 million and we launch the superconductor token. Then we can incentivize people to utilize this network, this framework, their contributions can be tracked through, for example, um, uh, lateral. If they log in with their Web3 wallet and they make some attestations on lateral, then there's a, web, there's a wallet, wallet address right there that we can track their contributions and we can send them some incentives. But the issue is, is how do you generate that capital? What are you selling to the people that you're raising money for, right? So one of the things number three on uh, we have three objectives with the superconductor collective the first one is to sort of aggregate and improve the research on the matter number two is just to ultimately replicate you know replicate record it and, and demonstrate to people the, the potential for it to be replicated and the final point is open-ended and it's actually the beginning it's, it's 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 the final point but it's actually the beginning of the next step which is once you've discovered this research and once you've got this growing corpus of knowledge you've got this hive mind how do you utilize the decentralized community to find applications, utilizations for the research that's being done? How do you then essentially monetize what you're doing? And then when it comes to, okay, so we've got an app, we've got the LK99 replicated and we want to start using it for applications. How do we prove or track the contributions such that any profits or any sort of revenue generated from this, this next uh, this next stage is distributed to the right participants. And honestly, this is, you know, it's, it's a big question. I have some thoughts personally about how you can create these incentive layers, but ultimately everything we're talking about right here is a wonderful idea, but it's not scalable in its current form because there is no incentive for people to utilize this apart from the good of doing science. So one of the things, you know, the, the IP NFT framework that Molecule has developed is a wonderful sort of uh, starting point for us to look at, how can you then generate something, create some kind of pattern and then uh, sort of distribute that back to people? But this is, again, this is a closed source um, ecosystem, the IP, right? You're taking an off-chain IP agreement, which closes it off so other people can't contribute so easily. Um, and then you're distributing the funding. So this is something that is a call to action to everybody in here as well, um, is to think very, very seriously about incentive mechanisms for science in a decentralized paradigm, right? Um, 
for for myself i do believe that there should be some kind of ownership over the progress but the ownership shouldn't be in the traditional ip system you know ip is broken it's a common phrase that we use and it's it's very very true um there is a lot of innovations to be had in this in this sort of in this sort of uh, industry of how can you take something that's fundamental to science and claim ownership over it when well, you can't but how do you incentivize scientists in order to do the to do the science right so eventually i do believe that science will be a public good right i believe that what we're building here what the work that's being done will be funded by some kind of central or not central just some kind of fund which just funds science because science improves the world but right now we don't live in that system so when we talk about incentives when we talk about quadratic funding you know quadratic funding is a wonderful way to distribute incentives but how do you get those incentives in the first place right and this is something that i think we all need to think very seriously about and if anyone has any thoughts or ideas on it uh please feel free to share uh rod you put your hand up did you have something you want to say yeah from that perspective uh i really like what uh what you are th saying because most people are related to quad quadratic funding are talking about distribution and almost no one thinks how how to raise money for the activity from that perspective uh, we decided to launch a dspace quadratic fund and right now we are struggling exactly with uh, that question how to raise money for the initiative um right now the main uh, hypothesis is that uh, for the first round we can get uh to kickstart the activity, we can we, we we have a wide community who could support it, and then to go to uh, new ways of finding such goods and under new ways. For example, I'm really interested in creation. I I think it could be useful uh, creation a dedicated uh, sorry launch of uh, dedicated uh, chains uh, where all the fees goes to fund uh, public goods. Um, definitely, uh, um, it's a really interesting idea, and the thing that I like about it is that it's uh, quite natural. So it would be great to find more ways to, to, you know, somehow to distribute uh, through, to distribute uh, value through the usage of the resources. I do not know how to explain it uh, uh, right now, but uh, I really was caught by that idea and happy to hear your feedback and uh, thoughts uh, about other interesting financial systems. So I think, I, think, um, I think one thing that is should be noted here is that this is a very positive feedback loop um, with what we're creating here. So the ability to consolidate or aggregate information and distill it in such a way as to visually understand where the blank parts or where the black parts of the map are, I think is an important way to coordinate fund generation and also to generate interest. I think part of the issue that exists in science is it's very hard to, recon to reconcile everything that's out there and see those dark parts. If we can hit that first step, so step one and two, I think the acquisition of funding is, becomes a lot easier because your pitch, your pitch deck, what you're looking to present becomes a lot more clear or a lot clearer for whether it be VC or public sources or whatever to understand like this is a gap and understand where the need comes from once that gap is filled. Um, so that's just one little two things I want to add. Carlos and Felix, we are approaching the top of the hour, so I will let you guys talk. Please keep it brief. Um, and then we're going to close this out just to have, you know, respect for everyone else's time. So, Carlos, please go. Yeah, um, to what Joshua said, uh, I think he's spot on. And my idea is that once we grow this, like, I have this idea of proof of thought, right? Once we grow this community around linking ideas and, and joining content in a productive way, you can just add your your question, like give me 10 business opportunities using this technology discussed here. And then those things can like, you can, we as a DAO can prove where that uh, those ideas came from. So we can figure out ways to like uh, have uh, uh, everyone wins type type of, of, of ownership of it where, okay, you brought the idea, uh, who's going to make it? it? It needs effort, right? And there's so many ideas that we need more people not gatekeeping the ideas, right? Because it, there's a, going to be a fractal explosion of possible things to do. That's a great way to put it, uh, Carlos. Thank you.
Felix, please. Yeah, no, and I think, uh, I, yeah, I think it's a great discussion. I also think, though, that, you know, having having participated in, in DSI for the last year and, and seeing all the amazing kind of players in the space, I think it's, it's really exciting because there's so many different people coming from different areas. And especially, you know, like the bio... The bio DAOs, like bio XYZ DAOs, you know, the incredible work they're doing, um, you know, people bringing in funding specifically for for causes they care about. Um, and, you know, I think the cool thing about this is and especially creating kind of a map of all the research going on um, and having, you know, the ability with uh, LLMs or uh, machine learning to actually match, you know, your research to your interests, opportunities to your interests overlap between different projects i think there's so much opportunity there because also part of what's uh, what's a problem right now is that it's really intransparent also to funders um you know what what is what is going on and i think the more that you can visualize that visualize kind of like the decision making process the the roadmap of what's happening you know you're really bringing in all the different parties um to then actually create incentives backed by by funding um so i i do think that there's a lot of potential here because in DSI specifically as well, there's so many different parties coming from the different angles um, that I think there's, you know, so many people trying to find solutions for the different parts um, that I think the incentive side is is one that's actually super exciting because there's so much opportunity. Absolutely. Johnny and Max, I see you, you came up. Please feel free to unmute yourself and add your few commentaries. Yeah, also on this uh, on this issue on how to raise funds, um, I think Felix said it really well that the the bio DAOs have pretty much demonstrated that if you have a community that is interested in the same topic and you can attract some experts, that uh, you can also attract funding. And I think we we can do the same here if we, like, basically it's an effort to bring together the whole ecosystem of DSI. So a lot of the, uh, the DAOs probably will chip in some of the capital that they have in order to also just like promote the whole space and move that forward. And with this capital that we already have committed, we can then go and uh, yeah, try more so traditional sources of funding. Maybe we can get a scientist who can replicate this to just write a grant and commit the grant into this decentralized winner. Um, and I think that, that the first, like what we really need to do is like form a team that is just focused on getting funding and yeah, then basically try to get funding just for the superconductor uh, effort. And yeah, it is a shared thing across the whole DSI space, which makes it a little bit different from the biodows, which are mostly driven by Molecule, right? So I see a lot of potential there in this way, but we would need a team. Maybe um, the guy who has been speaking about credit funding a lot, he could maybe lead it because he seems very passionate. Oh, Carlos, absolutely. It's okay. <laughs> No, that Absolutely. was Rod. That was Rod. No, no, no. Okay, okay. Oh, okay. Um, I mean, yeah. regardless, I think this is the most organic formation of what a quote-unquote DAO is, right? A lot of the times you see DAOs kind of spin up by a small group of individuals that then bring in community. But this is really a community-first initiative to then get all this infrastructure up. Um, so I love to see the formation of these ideas of different quote-unquote working groups to use the common DAO parlance occurring first, and then the DAO as an encapsulator will, uh, will probably form itself afterwards. Um, but Josh, you want to say something? Go ahead. Yeah, I just want to jump in there. So Johnny, thank you for bringing that to the sort of the, the, that concept to attention, right? That for something like this particular collective, the super, Superconductor Collective, it is going to have to be public goods funding, right? Like there's no way we can create a framework and look for funding in a short enough time that makes it useful because some some large, larger public institution will have the funding and, and beat us to the punch. And the impact that this can have for DSI is is huge, but it has to be, you know, whatever we're building has to be built in a relative speed, which is why we spun this up so quickly and why we're rushing to sort of spread the word so much is because, you know, a lot of, even Molecules, one of Molecules co-founders, Tyler, he did put a post up recently saying, I saw it, it said, uh, the superconductor research is the, a great use case for DSI or something more eloquent than that. Um, and for us, we at DSI, well, we genuinely believe that it is the one of the best entry points, one of the best sort of like uh, foots in the door for DSI to be considered a the the use case that we know it is, the valuable use that we know it is to science. Um, so yeah, this is going to have to be a DSI wide uh, venture, and a DSI world. That's kind of our entire wheelhouse, right? Is to uh, provide for essentially for free for most of the services we provide, right? Are all just sort of done altruistically. 
essentially for free for the ecosystem, right? DeSci World is trying to help grow and bootstrap DeSci uh, for the betterment of science, for the betterment of the DeSci projects building. And through our revenue model, because obviously we are a business, we have a self-sustaining revenue model. The, big, the bigger that DeSci gets, the bigger that we get. And so for us, our incentive, our biggest incentive is to grow DeSci. So something like this is, this is the reason that we're putting these things together is to make DeSci the, the you know the, the behemoth that it can be so when it comes to sorry Rod, just give me one moment so when it comes to uh collecting this public funding you know this deci wide funding for uh for the superconductor collective it will take altruism and it will take you know individuals or DAOs who have raised some money to just put some money towards this right so that we can incentivize the framework so that we can bring people to use it the quadratic funding or the distribution mechanisms we can certainly do that and, and rod if I would be more than honored for you to be the the lead on this because you you certainly have a lot of experience with this and, and a lot of passion. But what I would like to say to DSI in general and to everyone listening is DSI World is kind of that's all that's what we're here to do, right? Is to help evangelize DSI, to help organize and coordinate people within DSI on a on a person to person level rather than on a data or to a research level. And so things like getting people together to create noise, to create a, a you know a multi-sig, for example, where people can pull their funds to help uh, organize. That's the sort of thing that DCI World is here to do. So anyone listening and wants to sort of know how to, to create this or where to go to start the framework, you can kind of always lean on DCI World. That's what we're here to do. So Rod, please go. No, wait, wait, wait. Yeah. So, no, no, Sorry. no, 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 wait, wait, wait. wait, wait. <laughs> so yes, Joshua, I think that is a perfect uh, closing remark. As a matter of fact, just again, to be respectful to everybody's time. And also, you know, to play on the fact that always leave them wanting more. Um, we have a couple avenues where we can further this discussion. Um, Twitter spaces is just not going to be the one. We're going to have to actually close this out. But thank you all for coming in to participate. If you would like to contribute your time, your efforts, your ideas, please follow the link in the Jumbotron there, the Superconductor Collective. We have a Telegram group. We have other platforms. Come and join and let's further, let's continue the conversation there. Um, and see what we can actually build as proof of concept to show that DSI can do all the great things that we want it to do. Um, but with that being said, I do have to close this out. So guys, thank you so much as all participants for participating, all of our dear friends that we see all the time, um, Stanley, Carlos, Felix, Rod, Oksana, all of our new friends, Johnny, Maxwell, Joshua, everybody who's participated, we thank you very much. We thank you for your input. Um, again, please go join the Super Collective and let's see what we can actually do. And remember, this is a proof of concept for Superconductor, but it's also a proof of concept for DSI. This can be ported to any research endeavor. So if we can nail down a baseline infrastructure, then anybody can take this for any research endeavor. So keep that in mind. This is for the future, not just for Superconductor. So with all that being said, guys, thank you so much for participating. I will see you next week for our next episode of DSI Rising. And I look forward to talking to all of you in the Telegram chat and continuing this conversation. Thank, Thank you, Jelani. <laughs> Thank you, Jelani. Thank Thanks, John. Bye. Thank you.